is everyone's uh, inquiry going? Hmm? I asked that question the last time we were together. Is everyone now using inquiry? Or recognizing it, what it truly is? lately, um, it's shown up that the student uh, feels that they are in the heart uh, at, 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 to say, during the buddy call. <coughs> and yet with inquiry, it seems like a, a greater depth or a total uh, pure awareness is reached. And that comes as a, a kind of a surprise sometimes to the student that they've experienced being in the heart and yet the inquiry takes them so much deeper, particularly that question, who am I? A couple of them have started out thinking, well, just experiencing the I as having the experience that does so much so quickly that they feel, well, what else is there? But they're still uh, vulnerable, or they still have distracting thoughts, and they wonder how to uh, really get rid of them or, or clear that entirely. So anyway, this question of depth, I, I'm not sure that's the way to see it as increased depth, but is, is that it? Yes. See, if, if a person is only holding on to the sense of I, which is a beginning point of attending to consciousness, to hold on to the sense of I, there must be with that an intention to go deep into the I, to go to the source of the I. Some people only hold on to the sense of I, and they can hold on to the sense of I for years. And they never actually get to the source, the underlying, pure consciousness. If it's just the sense of I, you see, the sense of I itself, which is the sense of being an individual, is, a, is the contaminated consciousness. That's conditioned consciousness. It's not pure consciousness. So the inquiry carries you into pure consciousness, beyond the, the sense of I, which has within it the sense of not I. And so to be in pure awareness, it doesn't have either the sense of I or the sense of not I in it. It's just what Bhagavan calls the I-I, or what we have on the sign here, I, I. See, meaning just the radiance of pure awareness. And it's abiding in that radiance of pure awareness in which there is no sense of I as such. Because again, the sense of I has within it the sense of not I, or other. Anytime there's a sense of other going on, you can be assured you're not in pure awareness. You are in the sense of I. That's in duality. Whereas in pure awareness, that's non-duality. There's not two. There's no other. And that's what, that's my, my discovery is with a lot of people who, you know, read about inquiry in Bhagavan's books and so forth, and they talk about inquiry. <clears throat> what they actually are holding on to is the individual the sense of individuality. Now that's good, I mean that's that's better than not. That's holding on to the sense of I to the exclusion of all other thoughts. It's almost like a mantra. 
And I know that some of Bhagavan's uh, followers, in fact, some of his devotees, uh, talk in terms of using inquiry as a mantra. Well, that's okay, but that's not what Bhagavan taught. He didn't teach using it as a mantra. You don't make an inquiry, make inquiry into a mantra. You, you, uh, trend, you use the inquiry to transcend the mind. The mantra is going on in the mind. Are we all clear about this? Do we all get what we're talking about here? Sometimes I, I'm not so clear <clears throat> that the, in there I feel like I, I'm abiding in a self mm -hmm. that I feel this consciousness like a, a blooming or something but there is a is a is like a blooming or something like mm -hmm. this but there is still Sometimes, like then, I, I ask, is there any observer who is uh, observing this this consciousness? And it's like a shifting, uh, yes and no, and yes and no, or something like this. Mm -hmm. I'm not so totally clear about it. Mm. Well, if you're in the awareness, and if you say, "Well, I feel like I'm in the heart. I feel like I'm in the self." But now you want to look and say, okay, I'm feeling like I'm in the cell. Is there an eye there that is feeling like you're in the cell? Mm -hmm. That's your question. Is there an eye? See? If there is an eye, look to see if there's a sense of eye that feels like you're in the heart. If there's a sense of eye feeling like I am in the heart, that's still in the mind. Mm -hmm. Or when you're in the heart, in the self, as the cell, then there is no sense of I. There's just the awareness, just the pure consciousness, pure awareness as such. No I, no me, no my, no mine, no other, no this, no that, no thoughts going on. Just the awareness, just like the glow of awareness, so to speak. I, I get this, this kind of state, mm -hmm. but then... Then still, uh, I try to ask a question, is, is there any observer of this? Then I go back to the mind or something that maybe I shouldn't ask. Just no, if you're in that state, then you know, yes. nothing is necessary to be asked. Because mm -hmm. there really is no one to ask. Yes. See, the moment that you have something to ask at that point, then yes, you do bring up the I in the asking of the question. But you can look at this, sort of test yourself. You can, you know, be testing really where you are, where if you're in the, this glow of consciousness, just the pure awareness, it's just a glow of being, a radiance of your own being, see? of being itself. Now if there's no question, no thoughts, no nothing, see, it's when, when I say no, nothing, nothing in the mind, nothing uh, objective, nothing other that is going on, just being, see then nothing is necessary. Stay in that. Just stay in that. See? And in the, in the abiding in that, continuing to just abide in that, that in time, over time, absolutely purifies the mind. It just totally dissolves all the pattern tendencies of the mind, all the past, <laughs> all the conditioning of the mind, leaving only the pure awareness, leaving only the self. Nothing more you have to do if you're in that glow, if you're in that, if you're in that heart radiance. But you know, you have to stay firm there. You want to remain there and watch. They will, they, chances are something will come up. Someone will say something, meet someone, or a thought will come up. The moment that happens, you're back in the mind, which is all right. Just see that and then just keep aware of that glow and inquire. Ah, who's thinking this thought? Who's having this event? This experience, I am. There's the I there. So bring the I back into the awareness. Are you clear now? Yes. Okay. Okay, Baron. You uh, use the term that thoughts have to stop somehow, mm -hmm. and I have this experience of being very quiet and feels like being in the heart. And there is a kind of 
current of thoughts going on, but it feels more like like distant traffic noise, which is really not not affecting me at all somehow. Mm -hmm. but it's, it's going on. Okay. If you're if if you're aware of that and you're just staying in that glowing awareness, you're you're just in the awareness that is aware of that going on, and you're not being pulled by that, you're not being triggered by that. And it's kind of like clouds going over, you know, or like you say, distant noise, then that's fine. Stay in the heart. Stay in the self and just be aware that you are in the heart, you know. You, by knowing as we're talking about that you're in the heart, no I there at that time thinking that you're in the heart, but you're just the heart. Watching all of that, observing all of that, that will purify eventually, you see. The tendency for that current of thoughts so that they won't even be going on. Because they're going on in the mind. They're not going on in you, the self. See? You just remain as the awareness. See? Just as the self. And in due time, all those thoughts will play themselves out. And they'll have no effect on you whatsoever. Not that they have any effect on you at all when they're going, but the fact that they're there. You know, it's like, like as you say, it's like traffic going by. You know, Well, eventually they, will not, they won't even be that. There'll just be total peace, total peace, no disturbance at all, no distant sounds or anything. You'll just be absorbed in the pure peace of your being. Okay? okay. I have another one that I would like you to comment on. Okay. It's, it's an issue that I'm not not really clear about, it's about the relationship between grace and really being in charge and doing doing things. My experience is that in the course of the day, like it happens many times that I'm just in the heart without asking the question of the inquiry process, it just happens. You know? And sometimes it feels like I can't do anything to make it, to make it happen. You know? mm -hmm. but I've in my mind, there is also a notion that I can, that I will be able to train my mind more thoroughly in order to remember somehow. Mm. <laughs> That's not likely. <laughs> the mind won't want to remember the inquiry. Yeah. See? Uh, that's what we stress at the end of the I said program. It's not your friend. The mind is not your friend with regard to the inquiry. The inquiry is not the friend of the mind. Because the inquiry is literally dissolving the mind. It's dissolving all the conditioned patterns of the mind. See, when, we look, when you look at mind, see, what is mind? What is mind? Well, Bhagavan says, and you will realize from the heart, from the self, mind is nothing but thoughts. It's just continuous thinking. It's just thoughts themselves. That's all that mind is. Now, that's the contaminated aspect of consciousness. When consciousness is contaminated with thoughts that have been recorded as memory, that's mind. And so that memory replays over and over again. All that conditioned all those conditions, it's like a recording. It just keeps playing. The recordings keep playing over and over again. That's what mind is. So mind itself seems to have uh, a, a motivation of its own, an intention of its own. And that intention of its own is its own survival. Once the pattern of mind has been formed, then it locks in to survive itself, to keep itself alive, to maintain itself. And so it will not support you in doing the inquiry. And it's a paradox now. It's still the mind that you're doing. The, that's where grace enters. Your question had to do with grace. The grace is what will remind you to do the inquiry, not the mind. It's grace working on the mind which is drawing the mind back to its pure essence or bringing it back and purifying it as the self. So grace is what causes you to inquire, see. 
not just the mind and its nature, but grace. What, what's grace? Grace is the self. Grace is the heart. You see? Like Bhagavan uses the analogy, it's like the sun shining. It's always there, but in order to see it, you have to turn and face it. So you've got to come out of the darkness and face the sun to, know the, to see the sun. Likewise, you have to, to know the grace is there consciously. You have to give your attention to it, and that's giving your attention to the self. And that's what the inquiry does. It's the inquiry brings your attention back into the self to then partake more and more of the grace of the self. So it takes effort, actually, in order for the, paradoxically, the grace is always shining, but you have to make the effort to turn and face it in order to receive it. You see what I'm saying? Okay. But don't, don't we use, even with the inquiry, some kind of capacity of the mind as an initial state to just drop it or go beyond it or whatever? Oh Don't yes, see, the mind is being used in the inquiry, but the uniqueness of, of how the mind is being used with inquiry as opposed to how it's being used by any other sadhana, by any other method, is that in the inquiry you are literally merging the mind with the source. You are dissolving the mind in the very process of using the, of using the mind. So it's like uh, there are mystical uh, uh, ancient pictures that will show a snake swallowing its own tail. I don't know if you've ever seen those or not. A snake swallowing its own tail. That's kind of what the inquiry does. That's, see, it's just it's the snake swallowing, and the, the snake and the serpent represents the mind externalized, but here it's now, it's now eating itself. It's consuming itself. And that's what happens with inquiry. Mantra, it, that doesn't happen. See, you know, pranayam, any of any other sadhana, that doesn't happen. Now, that doesn't mean that people that use those sadhanas are not benefiting from them. If that's where they are, and that's all they can do. <laughs> if you might have been doing some other form of sadhana, such as mantra or whatever, before you came to the inquiry, at least that brought you to the inquiry. So those are they are beneficial. These other sadhanas but they don't go direct into the self, direct into the heart. They don't dissolve the mind immediately, like the inquiry does. <clears throat> so again, to sum up, in summation of your question, or the answer to your question, is yes, grace is what will motivate and give you the intention to use the mind to dissolve the mind. That is grace working. The mind on its own, by itself, without grace, will not likely do that. So it's a grace that does that. And as Bhagavan says, grace is always there. It's the grace that, that brings you into sadhana to begin with. If it wasn't for grace, you wouldn't be involved in sadhana. Okay? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does everyone get these questions? Uh -huh. Yes. Is, uh, is intuition is also is a mind? In what? I'm sorry? Is, is intuition. Intuition? Intuition. 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 Oh, intuition. Yes. Mm. Okay. Is this uh, still in the mind? Well, it's a, intuition, you might say, is the quality of consciousness in more pure. Yes, it still works through the mind. But it really is coming more from the heart, from the self. And how do you di differentiate the, the thoughts and intuition? It's very subtle, mm -hmm. and yet sometimes it's not subtle at all. It's according to where you are in consciousness. It's according to where you are more na where you're normally abiding. If you're in the heart most of the time. And when the heart is speaking, that's pure and direct intuition. That's just the self speaking. And there's no doubt about that. There's no question about that. You just know. But if you're in the mind, if you're still strongly identified with the mind and affected by the thoughts of the mind, intuition may speak. 
and you may wonder, you may doubt. It seems to be the appropriate thing. You may, you might be guided by intuition to act in a certain way, to do a certain thing, or to not do something. But you may still doubt it. You may still question. Usually, when that happens. Usually when that happens, the moment you get the intuition, you ought to act right away before the mind gets in there and starts reasoning, see? Okay? Jordan? It's surrendering to Arunachala, the equivalent of uh, inquiry into the self. Yes. What is Arunachala? So. See, when you say Arunachala, if it's just a mountain, then one mount, any mountain will do. <laughs> In a manner of speaking, not really, but uh, the, the, the uniqueness of Arunachala is when you consider Arunachala, Arunachala is pure consciousness. Why? I don't know. I don't know that Bhagavan even knew. He just called it mystery of mysteries. And the Puranic stories about it describe it as being Shiva, as being Lord Shiva. Not an abode of Shiva, but a manifestation of Shiva. The Runachala is now, actually, technically speaking, everything is Shiva. But there's a uniqueness about Arunacha. We can say everyone is a manifestation of the self. Yet that doesn't mean that, being, that everyone being a manifestation of the self, that all beings are equal in that regard. There's some beings that you can hang out with and you'll be in conscious company and other beings you can hang out with and uh, you might gather tendencies or pick up tendencies or habits or characteristics or inclinations that are harmful. So even though everything is occurring in the self, not everything is a pure manifestation of the self. But Arunachala is a pure manifestation of the self. Again, that's just the mystery of mysteries as to why it being, why it's that way. I don't know why it's that way. I don't know that anyone really does. It's just been that way since ancient times. The sages and saints that have come here have sung, you know, written poetry about it, sung songs about it, talked about it, and so forth since times of antiquity, so it just is. Bhagavan called it the center of the universe. 
So, it represents the center of your own being. So when you're tuned into that quality, the quality of, that Arunachala is, by considering it reverently for what it is, that quickens that same quality, so to speak. It magnifies that same quality in your, of your own being as your own being. And when you're, when you're sensitive to that, when you're alert to that, you're aware as that, then yes, surrender to that. Surrender to that. So in that sense, when you're aware of that, you can surrender that wherever you happen to be. You don't have to be in Tarubanamala. Anywhere then you consider Arunacha. Yesterday Patricia was sharing that she was doing production of the you all were doing production yesterday morning and she was sharing last evening in the closeout, in Cecil closeout. That I I joined in, in with them in Cecil closeout last night. And that she was feeling this quality in doing production around the Runachala, a special quality. Yes, I understand that quality and what that quality is. And my statement to her was always be doing production around Runachala. And no matter what your actions are, let them be the actions of production. See, you're always revolving around the self. Can you sense that? Can you tune in with that? that? No matter what you're engaged in, no matter what the activity is, let that activity be a production. See? Which itself is a surrendering to a runacha. It's letting all the tendencies of the mind be dissolved by the grace of a runacha, the grace of the self. Do we all get that? While you're here, while we're all here, let's really utilize the great benefit of the grace of, your, of Arunacha. It's no ordinary mountain. Now, there may be other similars in other places. I don't know, but I don't need to go look for any. You have this one. So, um, is there a definite term? Uh, advantage uh, of doing production around uh, Arunachala to doing production in the Samadhi Hall? Mm. I would say yes. They're both good. No question about it. But Bhagavan did production around Arunachala. And since Bhagavan did production around Arunachala, and he recommended it while he was living in the body, people were there, they could have done production around him. But he said, no, go do it to a rune unchop. So, yes, his presence, no doubt, unquestionably, it's uh, present in the shrine room and in the old hall. So it's very beneficial. But still, a rune unchop has its own unique quality. So I would say yes, a rune unchop. Mm -hmm. Do both. Mm -hmm. Since you have the, you can avail yourself of both. It takes a little longer to go around a Runachala than it does around his shrine, so go often around the shrine and as often as you can, or as you feel the inclination, around a Runachala. And the tradition is at least three times. You see. Go around at least three times while you're here. I don't know why three, but maybe it's all the Trinity Rama, Vishnu, and Shiva. I don't know, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. <laughs> okay? Yes?
you just sort of more or less co-relating those two, the, um, the she, well, Shiva and so forth, and then uh, the trinity of uh, the uh, Christianity sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, just wondering about uh, your contemplation for the three months prior to your transformation of uh, Christ's realisation of um, the Father and I am one. Now, you would have considered or a person would have thought or expected your transformation to have taken place within that context of that tradition. And yet it went well out of that tradition to, to an entirely different, to Bhagavan. Well, that's so, only an appearance. So it indicates the universality of the self. The exactly. Mind. That to me, there's, there's no difference. It's not any different at all. It's just different names and different words, but for, for what? For the same thing. See? Do you have a brother? Is he older or younger? Does he have children? Okay. Do they call you uncle? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Sir. Okay. And your is your parents still living? Well, but when they were, they called you son. Do mm-hmm. you have any children? Okay. But you see, you've been called by different names, but there's still all those names that they that you've been called are still you. Uncle, by your nephews or nieces, still, still, it's still you, see? Brother, you're called brother, that's you. You get the point. So it doesn't matter what name you're being called by, it's still you, it's still the same self, see? And in exactly the same way, you see? They're, you know, it, it said in the in the Jewish Christian tradition, from the, in the uh, in the uh, Old Testament, you know, "Hear ye, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one, one Lord, one God, meaning one Brahman, See? the same as Brahman, no different. See? Traditions are different, but God is one. The source is one." The self is one. They may use different terminology, different ways of expressing it, but once you've had the experience, once you're in that quality, as that quality, from that quality, then there's no difference. And and I do, in my speaking, or relating with people, or wherever they're coming from, I can be with them. Christians, Jews, I can be with them just as easily as I can be with Hindus. No problem with me whatsoever, because I see no difference. Okay? Now, maybe you might ask, why am I here, and why why that looks different, and I seem to be putting more emphasis upon Bhagavan. I was frankly thinking about it yesterday. I thought, gee, we ought to have, when the group comes, we ought to bring us another picture of Jesus. Why don't we have a picture of Jesus here? It's fine to have it. We gave one of the ashram, and it's up. I don't. I haven't been to dining hall recently. I guess it's still there. Nice big picture of Jesus that we donated to the ashram a number of years ago. And at our center at home, we do have uh, pictures of Jesus around. Uh, in America, I put. I do give a lot of emphasis to Jesus, but I'm also giving the emphasis to Bhagavan. And why do I give seemingly more interest, interest to, uh, not interest, uh, emphasis to Bhagavan? Well, frankly, it was Bhagavan actually that brought me into the heart. I, I, I started the affirmation. I started the thinking in that direction. But as far as from the mind's relationship point of view, I was drawn to Bhagavan, and Bhagavan is the one that threw me into the cell, so to speak. He's the one that dumped me. <laughs> He's the one that baptized me. <laughs> so when I was baptized with Bhagavan, well, I just sort of 
sort of like a duck, you know, that when they're hatched, you know, they, what do they call that? They, uh, imprint. Yeah, they imprint upon, you know, and so I got imprinted upon Bobby Wood. <laughs> <laughs> but I still have just as much uh, love and respect and appreciation for Jesus as I do for her, as I do for Bhagavan. But I'm not a Christian. Neither am I a Hindu. You know, I'm not a Muslim. But I can speak. I'm not that familiar with the Muslim tradition that I can speak about the, the Quran and that kind of thing. I can. But I can speak with a Muslim if they're just open to the self, if they're open in consciousness to truth. You see, then I can work, then I can uh, relate and communicate in a, in a conscious manner, or any tradition. Atheist, I love having a discussion with atheists. That's fun. So-called atheist. <laughs> Does that answer your question? It just occurred to me that you have many pictures of Jesus and Bhagavan just sitting around the room here. I mean, nobody took Jesus' photo. How do you know? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Are you having any water or something? Good as anybody. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just to come to her with my child. Just to be here. Just to hang out with a conscious being. Not everyone has knowingly met a conscious being. That's grace in itself. But that happens in your life. Like Yogananda, Paramahansa Yogananda, who wrote that book, The Autobiography of Yogi. Familiar with that book? It's a very popular book. Look how many saints that fellow knew. Huh? Isn't that something? He had a, really had a blessed life, didn't he? You consider that to have met, had satsang and darshan of so many conscious beings, sages and saints. It's rare to have met and known and be in the conscious company of that many sages and saints. In that sense, Ganesha is kind of unique too. Ganesha is meant to be. Ganesha is, a, you know, he used to be the manager of the ashram, was the, editor, the, uh, was the managing editor of the Mountain Path, the magazine, for a number of 20, what, 25 years. He's uh, Sundram's younger brother. He's the middle brother. Sundram's the oldest, and Ganesha is the middle brother, and Mani is the youngest. Ganesha, goodness knows how many saints he's known, you know, he's been with. Being in his capacity as the manager of the ashram and manager of the mountain path, I don't know, just traveling as he did and coming to be with, you know, he'd hear about different ones and he'd go and spend time with them and visit them. He's been with many. Now, on the other hand, there can be people that go and hang out with them and still, still be just as much in body mind. <laughs> Look at all the people that live here in Jerusalem, that were born here and lived here. That have no spiritual inclination whatsoever. Even though it says to live here, the Bhagavan says, there are what, statements in the Puritan that says to live within roughly what is it, ten, uh, real guineas or something like that, I don't know what the word is, meaning about 30 miles of the hill is to be guaranteed with the grace of the heart. But you see, that's when you consciously choose, when you're consciously aware and choose to live here and be here. Those that are just born here, he said, well, well, didn't they choose to also to be born? Yes, in an indirect way. It's beneficial. There's a purification process going on with everyone who lives here. But look how many there are that that's going on in such a subtle way. It is so subtle. It's so rarefied 
that it's almost like it's not happening, at least in this lifetime. It is. It's going on. It's beneficial. But they won't see the fruits of it for a while, for many more lifetimes. Again, that's how grace works. It's what you're ready for. Grace was there. You can jump in and take the whole thing, then jump in and take the whole thing. Take as much as you can receive. As much as you're capable of receiving. Early in my life, I said, I want it all. <laughs> Give me all. A little bit's not enough. <laughs> I was greedy. Hmm? Greedy for God. Greedy for truth. That's, that's, that's the only kind of greed that's worthwhile. To be greedy for God. And then eventually you have to give up that greed. You give it up, can't have it. <laughs> It'll get you there, and give it up and jump in. <laughs> Yes, Richard. Uh, on that note, yesterday I was reading the Bible and saying something about uh, slaying these thoughts as if they're uh, as they come out of the fort one at a time. You slay them with the sword of the quest for truth, and that just that phrase, the sword of the quest for truth, just. Uh, says so much and I with this greed for truth or something it's like using that sword to get to get through the, the stuff <laughs> yeah yeah inquiry is the sword it destroys the mind It can be a sword, it can be a pair of knife. <laughs> Cut it down to size. Use it whichever way. It's a handy at the time. It can also be an atomic bomb. Blow the hell out of mine. <laughs> I've been reading the Supreme Truth. It's a retranslation of the Yoga Vashistha. Oh, that's a beautiful. That is so beautiful. It's so pure. It's ancient. Goodness knows how it is. It's where Vashistha was the guru of Lord Rama. So it's the instructions of Lord Rama by his guru. Rama is going through his enlightenment, going through his transformation. He had all the questions about reality, about truth, and so he's just as answering and telling him all about the way it is. And some of the stories that they tell they just do not give the mind a chance. <laughs> they're just they're designed to literally blow the mind. And they do. And the beauty of it is, there's nothing in the way of modern analogies because they didn't have anything modern in those days, so to speak. Maybe we, we don't know about it, I don't know. But, but they would use such simple analogies to make such a profound statement, such a profound point. Of course, coming from the consciousness. 
But the stories that they tell, that Vashista is telling to Ram, Rama, in order to point out the uh, illusion of the world, the illusion of manifestation, the illusion, the illusion of objective reality, uh, the non-reality of time. And it just doesn't leave you a leg to stand on. It doesn't leave the mind a leg to stand on. It doesn't, you just, just blows the illusion away. It's completely gone. They, it's just filled with stories like that. I read, uh, this is my, I guess, second time to go through it. I've, I've read it years ago all the way through, and then I went back and kind of read it in bits and pieces. But this time, this is a new translation, so I'm taking it from the beginning and going slowly with it all the way through. I'm enjoying it. Are any of you familiar with Yoga Vashistha? Have you read it in the There's an older version of it that's been around for a long time. I have. I have that. It was given to me by a friend of mine just a few months, actually, after my transformation. So I read it then. It was very helpful to me at that particular time. Now I'm just kind of enjoying it. I'm <laughs> just enjoying it. There's one account, for example, let me give you an example. How much we got there? I got no time to give you the example. Yeah. There's a queen and her husband, the king, and it goes into a long, the shista goes into an elaborate explanation of him, what kind of a wonderful person, very, you know, generous, very intelligent, very wise, very compassionate in his kingdom, and as he ruled his kingdom. And uh, been all about his wife, Leela, is his wife's name. His name is Problem. And uh, and all about his wife, and she too was very beautiful, and explained her in detail the physical characteristics and features. You know, her skin. She was lotus skin, and all of it. You know, goes fully into detail all about how beautiful she was, what their relationship was together, how how special. You know how they just uh, didn't like to be apart. They were so close together and everything. And just a wonderful, beautiful relationship that the king had with his queen. And then she uh, began to realize, think about, what if he were to die? I, if he were to die, I want to be assured that his soul, I, I would be devastated without him his presence. So she wanted to make sure that his soul would never leave the palace, that he would always be there to be with her after he died. So she did uh, uh, penance and uh, for quite some time, and eventually Parvati appeared, and so she asked for a boon, and Parvati gave her some two boons, and that was what it should, the primary one, there was another I don't remember, but the primary one was her, her quest, request that the husband's soul would remain there. And so, sure enough, he died shortly thereafter, sometime thereafter. And of course, she was devastated, but his presence was there. And so this went on for a while. And uh, then it came to a wonder where he and his expression of himself, even though his presence is here, his soul is here, wonder where he is. So she did penance again, and she prayed to Parvati, and Parvati came. And... Uh, she asked, you know, I'd like to be where he is. And so she said, okay. So she took him, took her to where he was. And she, here he was, king again, ruling his throne. Again, a very wise and compassionate king and so forth. And all of his ministers and consorts and all that were there with him. See, and there was one that was there that was her. <laughs> So here she was there with him too. And so then 
she could say, well, how can this be? And so all along, Parvati was telling me how it's, everything is an illusion. It's just all a dream. It's just all going on, you see, in consciousness. And so he says, let me tell you this. He said, then let me tell you another, let me tell you a story. And then she tells a story about this wise sage whose name was Vashista, but not the same Vashista. But there's a little bit of a trick in that too. I'm, you know, in tuning in with it. And he and his wife, and the sage, you know, was a very sage and kind person, wise person, and so forth with his wife. And the same thing happened. His wife had asked whenever he passed that he could, that she would be able to be with, his soul would be present with her at all times. And he said, and then Parvati says, and that happened eight days ago. And, and he died. And then when he died, when he died, he became the king, a king. Oh, one day he was up on the mountain and, and he looked down and he saw a procession of a king in procession and it, it came to him, a wish came to him to be a king. I would like to be a king and have all this and all pomp and all the circumstances and all this going on with me and so forth. And so he died and he became the king. And that was your husband and you are his wife. And, he's, and then he said, she said, well, how can that be? He said, well, that's the way it is. And, he said, and then he said, and that happened eight days ago. <laughs> <laughs> so only eight days before, <laughs> the shista had died, had become a king, gone through a whole lifetime, had died and gone through another lifetime as a king. <laughs> eight days ago. Huh? Eight days ago. Yeah. The details are, you know, a little bit more there. I'm just giving you a very highlight of it. But I mean, when you bring you into the whole event and all the experiences, and then wham, they hit you with that, that three different lifetimes have taken place. <laughs> then this, that happened all eight days ago. Namaste. Namaste. <laughs>